Welcome to the hottest real estate topics on the planet, keeping you up to date with all the creative ways to buy and sell real estate without bank qualifying, so anyone can build real income starting today. Here is another great show with Dealmaker Bill and Pete the Rookie. Here we are at another episode of Flipping Houses for Rookies. Episode number 197, Peter. 197. Yeah. And have no idea what to do with uh, episode 200. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, for, cel for celebration. Yeah, you know? right? I want hey, Bill, you know what be funny? Huh. For, for 200, we should replay episode one. Oh, yeah. Huh. That's what I want to do is go back to when it was all scratchy and we couldn't hear one another and we were like recording it in the car and shit. Yeah, that's what we want to do. <laughs> send send our, our, our listeners back to 1839 with the technology, right? <laughs> yeah, they'd appreciate 201 that way. <laughs> it's like now we, we appreciate more what we had before and all the stupid complaints. They're kind of gone, you know? There you go. Stop bitching about the little shit, folks. There you go. All right, so today's episode is called, this is for you, Peter. Oh, boy. Predictable, gargantuan, predictable, gargantuan. How do you like those words? I, I like those. I know those, too. Yeah, predictable, gargantuan profits found in real estate emerging markets. Oh, God. <laughs> just, oh like, God. just like a tide of the ocean coming in and going out, uh, is on a predictable schedule. Real estate marketing cycles <clears throat> go up and down predictably too. Don't they? Market well, <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. I mean, right now is interesting. Yeah. Market <laughs> cycles go up and down predictably too. Uh, unlike ocean, unlike the ocean, let me get on like, yeah, unlike the ocean in real estate, the tide always rises over time. And if you hold real estate long enough, you'll actually make money. Even better because there are large and small markets all with their own cycles. It sometimes looks like random motion. But once you hear what we're going to talk about in this podcast, you will soon see these cycles are not random but have very predictable telltales that are very obvious once you know what to look for. As soon as you are done listening to this podcast, you will know more than about 95% of all the real estate investors out there and how to use key indicators like a crystal ball when it comes to profits in real estate investing. Emerging markets are the most exciting part of the real estate market because of the millions you could make with these simple understandings of economic movements, management of cities, and cravings of buyers wrapped into one package with one big bow called profit. Nice. Mm. Nice one, Bill. Yeah, you like that, huh? Yeah, sure. All right, so yeah. let's get started because we've been kind of goofing off enough here. <clears throat> Am I allowed to smoke a cigar in this session? Sure, you talk about it enough. Show people you really do it. <laughs> That's all I do. It's is not smoke. just like like it's not like George Burns just sticks one in there and walks around. You actually, you're gonna see smoke here, folks. You just be glad you're on a screen. Yeah, right. Stop. <laughs> Sound like my wife. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we're in the same camp. You're out. You know, you're not. You're outnumbered. But what do you care? <laughs> hey, you know what I That's say, what, folks. You know, That's why you're outside, Bill. You know what I say? What? And when you say I'm outnumbered, yeah. underestimate me, please. I work better that way. <laughs> oh, good one. Good one. Yeah, act uh, shy and demure. Yeah. And innocent. Go ahead, do it. Yeah, exactly. All right. That's what. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Let's goof around. Go ahead. Emerging markets take many forms. And you know this a little bit more than I because you've done a little bit more research on some of the emerging markets we're talking about, right? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know if you, well, you'd say I know a little more than you, but that's not a lot either because it's, uh, there, there's a few things to, to track and pay attention to. So yeah. go ahead. We'll talk as you go. So emerging markets take many forms. Most, uh, most after years of dormancy and stagnation, mm -hmm. right? Some 
uh, areas or big cities uh, spring back to life. So you have this area and it's dormant and stagnant and then all of a sudden it springs back to life, right? The mm -hmm. simplest way to understand, which is an emerging market by the way, the simplest way to understand and characterize these, uh, these markets are to observe these two things. Ready? Yeah. One, people are migrating in rather than leaving. Mm. Right? One, people uh, are yeah. migrating in. In other words, they're coming in instead of leaving. Right. Two, jobs are being created rather than destroyed. Yep. Okay? So, you and I both know, because we kind of live by this same policy, if you would, is that statistics don't go down, do they? Statistics, statistics don't go down. Well, I have a few that look like they're going down. What do you mean by that? They're held down. Well, they're held down. <laughs> they just don't go by themselves. Yeah. So it's yeah, usually... Something Something makes it happen. It's total cause and effect. So something makes it happen, right? So in our mm -hmm. personal lives, we try not to take responsibility for the fact that, oops, we made the statistic go down. We, well, we try to blame it and like assign cause somewhere else. And well, that wasn't me. You know, I did everything I was supposed to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, point, point fingers. Yeah, exactly. So, you <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. You, ha you, you may have noticed uh, at one point in your life where the market grows so rapidly, there are never uh, shortages of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to give that again. The markets grow so rapidly that all of a sudden there's like this big shortage and severe shortage. It's not just a shortage, a severe shortage of workers and have to recruit from other cities. Have you ever encountered yeah. that? So. You know, it could be in your own town, could be wherever, but all of a sudden, you know, it's like all of a sudden, like everybody's working and there's a shortage, shortage of workers, right? Yeah, yeah. Great wealth can be built in a very short period of time in these unique settings because both rents and property values ra rise quickly. This is an there's emerging market. Supply yeah, the supply and demand change. There's more demand. There's not enough supply. Rents can go up. Uh, values can go up because it's just scarce. Totally. More scarce. Totally. To make millions of dollars in the shortest amount of time is quite straightforward. Let me just make sure my recording's still going here. Okay, good. Uh, so to make millions of dollars in a short period of or a short amount of time, it is quite straight forward. It's just this simple. You simply need to buy or control as much or as many properties as you can in an emerging market. That's it. Right? Yeah. But it's but you're saying emerging, not emerged. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Not when it's too late, but more on the front end. Right. So how do you have that crystal ball, which is what we're going to talk about today? Yeah. Okay. This is no yeah. different. <clears throat> this is no different than someone picking up diamonds for a fraction of their price just before there's a lot of command or a lot of uh, demand, I should say, for a price increase. Hmm. Like, for example, I'll give you one. It's probably not a great example, but like Valentine's Day. Yeah. Right. Or you know, there's a wedding season in every city, you know, like based on you, I think based on the weather, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, each city or each country, uh, you know, they all have like this demand for, you know, uh, and I know because I do a lot of events and stuff for the church and I used to, you know, do events for management success, which was a company I used to work for. And, you know, certain times of the year, it's really hard to rent halls because there's a demand for weddings. Right. Right. It's like everybody's trying to get married in a certain period, right? Uh, and yeah, and watch out for Christmas. Watch out for Christmas parties around Christmas time. Yeah, exactly. You better book those ahead. Yeah. Things like that. Exactly. Okay, so you know, if you knew that, if you knew those cycles, you could buy diamonds in the right time, right? Yeah. Uh, or wedding wedding dresses would be a better one, right? And mm -hmm. and yeah. and be able to to ride the curve, right? 
Sure. So it takes aggressive and thoughtful leaders of an area, town, or city to turn that market around. Mm -hmm. This is not for the weak, right? After these off officials analyze and uh, and assess, so they analyze and assess an area, these aggressive leaders uh, with a lot of courage and strength develop a master plan to be implemented. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second because I know I'm reading. So what, what does that mean to you, Peter, a master plan? Well, um, <clears throat> I've spoken to uh, some cities about this. They have a plan where they, they know what's coming. Like there's a city in my area, and I'm not gonna say it right now because I think I got the, uh, the inside skinny a little bit. But it's a, it's a bad city. It's like nobody wants to buy stuff there. And I'm thinking, well, it's gotta turn around someday. So there are things supposed to be happening. And when I call the economic development, uh, they have to sit down and figure, all right, we have business coming, we have people coming, what are we gonna do? Well, we should build an apartment over there. How about somebody <coughs> build something? And if the roads are gonna have a lot of traffic, there's a town nearby where there's uh, a big manufacturing facility, they're widening the road because they know a lot of traffic is coming in to build, to bring supplies, uh, more workers. So they have to plan this so everything fits together, the traffic, the building, what's going to happen for taxes, how much are we going to make. So they have to sit and kind of plan the whole city. You ever been in a city where it's a mess, like the streets go this way and that way? You know, that kind of happened by itself once upon a time. It's a bit of a mess. Things get uh, uh, crowded. So they do work out together with the different departments what they should do. They put in a big plan. You can get a hold of it and ask for it and look at it to see what's coming. Right. <clears throat> so uh, that's all good. Except, what is a plan? A plan is just a plan. Are they really doing it? Are they going to do it? Did it start yet? Do they have the money in place? Things like that. Is it real? Or is it just people talking? Right. So, all the things you're talking about is what I want to just chat about for a second. So, a plan is just what you said. Uh, so, to me, what a plan is, 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 is it's agreement. Right? Yes. So, somebody has an idea. You know, whether it be an executive or, you know, <clears throat> anything else like that. Uh, but they have a plan, okay, and they went around and got agreement. So, like, what you're saying is, is there's agreement that, what's the first agreement that you got to make in, in, a, in an emerging market? Like, this place sucks, right? Yeah. Like, we need well, to fix it, this, right? This yeah, is not okay. No. We should do something about this, right? Well, it's funny you said before, what's a statistic? Why does it go down? Right. It doesn't go down, it's hell down. Right. And when you start to talk about emerging market, when you said leadership, somebody has to come and lift it up. Right. You know, somebody has to get elected that doesn't look for, I don't know, handouts or grants or money for the poor. They look for work. They look for how do you get it to come back? Right. You know, how do you build it so it's actually viable? It's like if you're broke, you can go ask your family for some bucks for a while, but you better get a job. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> we were talking about this. I, I've been doing a lot of virtual stuff, you know, between my coaching group and internship. And last night we had a meetup. We had a phenomenal response in the meetup. I had guys from all over the country on the call. Dozens and dozens of people all over the, all over the country on our call. That's crazy. Yeah, That's crazy. It was really cool. Um, but one of the things that we were talking about is, um, <clears throat> yeah, I get it about the virus, and yeah, I get about the economic point, but uh, I mean, so, you know, like in Connecticut, the, the, the governor has put out an executive order that we as landlords are not allowed to do any evictions. Uh, we're not allowed to, uh, you know, push off any sort of, um, if the renter doesn't want to pay, they can not pay. And the last thing, there was four things on the list. I should have wrote them down, but there's four things. On the, list. the last thing he said is there's an executive order that the, the uh, tenant has the right to use their security deposit for their rent. I mean, 
We all know my feelings about our governor in Connecticut, the liberal guy that he is. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, he doesn't have apartments and he doesn't know what it's like to be a landlord. Obviously, he doesn't run a checkbook and he doesn't get it. Right. Well, he gets paid no matter what happens, doesn't yeah, he? Totally. Right. So. Yeah. What I was saying is, is okay. So even banks are talking about you know having some liberties on payments right now, right? Well, yeah. The well, the other hand has to hold true too. If it doesn't go in one end, it can't come out the other end. Come on. Right. So let's say they <clears throat> you get liberties for three months, right? Your your mortgage is fifteen hundred dollars a month, right? Yeah. And you don't pay for three months, right? So fifteen hundred times three is forty five hundred, right? Sure. On month four, you owe six thousand dollars. Well, aren't they going to just put that at the end of the mortgage and no, not ask them to pay? They're not doing Whoa. that. They're not Whoa. doing that. Come on. What? I was in a network meeting yesterday morning at seven o'clock a.m. and the mortgage guy said all they're doing is just relieving the payments. Month four, you have to pay the diff pay pay the money. I thought I heard something different, but that's nuts. Yeah. That ain't gonna work. So, well, doesn't that make it like okay, you're you're three months behind? They can start the paperwork now, right? Mm -hmm. For, start the foreclosure procedure. Right. Lovely. So, you know, the thing to do is 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 to fix it, and that's what we're talking about with these officials. The thing to do is to fix it because you can't keep kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Okay. So, these these politicians go into an economic zone. Or, or we'll call them managers, going to an economic zone, and they'll create packages for investors in certain areas. It usually starts with investors, right? Because investors will bring the money in, right? Yeah. And uh, they'll make, like, uh, deals with these investors so they can start doing, so they can start doing <clears throat> uh, rehabs. Because the first thing you got to do is you got to take the, the 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 property that's distraught and you got to lift it up right you got to start rebuilding it yeah yeah you got a bad area it just looks crummy the streets are bad the buildings are bad right you got to make it more attractive so people would go there work there live there other businesses would come in right so they have to give those incentives and tax breaks and whatever to make it easier or inviting to come do business there. Right, so these investors come in, you know, they make deals with investors to bring them in, and we'll talk about what those are in a minute, right? And they're gonna wanna re rehab existing inventory or build new housing units. And these incentives will be uh, outlined in this master plan. Mm -hmm. So the master plan is an agreement of how we're gonna turn this around. What is the city willing to do to attract these types of people, people like you and I, right? which allows yeah. investors to receive things like low interest loans, right? Mm -hmm. Tax abatements, mm -hmm. right? And uh, block grants. What is a tax abatement? Uh, well, they'll reduce your taxes. Um, I mean, it could be zero or really low for maybe 10 years to give you like years to get the business up and running, things right. get profitable. Right, good. So these aggressive incentives can motivate large companies to start moving in. Mm -hmm. See how the cycle starts, right? Well, you know, <laughs> you can only go so far down until you got to come up. Right. And uh, yeah. so once the rehabbers start rehabbing an area, and which, by the way, uh, Peter, you and I are both both old farts. We know that. So uh, we're, we're on a podcast right now, so we know that millennials listen, so we got to use some millennialese, okay? Yeah, we, millennialese. Yeah. So what would that be, Bill? So what we're talking about right now is gentrification. Mm. That's, what they, that's what the millennials call now, gentrification. That means you come into an area and you turn it into something that it's not. You're going to change it so that others will, you know, so, the, so it'll attract people right right that, so they call it gentrification now okay mm -hmm. back in the day we didn't have that word we didn't use that word but we use that word now what do we, what do we say like hey it looks pretty now 
No, we rehabbed it. <laughs> All right, so that means that you're going to start attracting more jobs. People start moving into the area, the town, the city, and there starts this momentum starts. Mm -hmm. Right? And as the quality of life improves and jobs increase, even more people want to move in. Yep. Right? Existing businesses will expand to sell more furniture, clothing, cars, hardware, household goods, all kinds of things. Food, yeah, food, food pizza, yep. haircuts. I mean, everything that you need, you need a little more of. Right. So you can actually, uh, you can determine actually what jobs are coming into the area and when. And like you already mentioned, you could do this by contacting the city's economic development department or committee. Because mm -hmm. some smaller areas don't have departments, they have a committee. And what, what happens now when you call the economic development committee or the, 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 uh, the department, what do they have? Well, they, they should have plans, like they that have, master plan you They have the plan, about. yeah. So what happened was, going back to plans, somebody had an idea, they got a bunch of agreement, they're like, oh, let's do this. They actually work out the available resources, because some cities have some better resources than others, right? They work out resources, they work out the tax abatements, they work about you know, the incentives, the interest rates, and they put it all in writing. Mm -hmm. The reason why they put it in writing is so other people can understand it, right? So if it's in writing, it's true because what is really truth? Truth is really agreement. It's really what we all agree upon, right? I mean, if we all, if we yeah. all agree that we should stay home because of this virus, then it's true, mm -hmm. right? If we all agree that we should smoke cigars where we're doing a podcast, then everybody would be smoking a cigar right now. Right? <laughs> so the point is, is that once you put it in writing, you can start building more agreement. More importantly, you can start getting action implemented. Right. Because it's laid uh, out. Investors are not, yeah, investors are not going to go in and start spending money unless it's for real. Right. So they need things written down, agreed, signed by legal beagles and whatever. Right. And, you know, in the minutes of the the town committee, council meetings, or whatever it is, so that's really real. You're not going to go spend money otherwise. Right. So one of the things, that actually, let me, let me give you this. So one way that, w one of the things that we do, there's a couple of things I want to talk about that we do, meaning mostly you because you do it, is first of all, we have a website that we use that you can go mm -hmm. on, and it's very helpful. And that website is datausa.io. Data USA dot io that's d like in david a like an apple t like in tom a like an apple u like an umbrella s like in sam a like an apple dot i like an indian o like an octopus so it's data usa dot io site's got mm -hmm. a lot of good information mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we'll just kind of like poke around and just look at stuff and then you'll call the economic development right Yep, now, sometimes. Now, here's a trick. This is an important trick that you should listen to, not you, the listeners, okay? Okay. Is it possible that we could have s people that say things and don't do anything? No, that never happens. <laughs> not with human beings, right? No. So one of the things that you should check on before you start moving into an area is where is the city spending money? Hmm. What, what money are they allocating? You know, like, ha, are, have they released any of these loans to rehabbers? Right. You know, how many rehabbers have they given loans to? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, because, you know, they'll also get grants from the state and the federal government as well. Yeah. And you can see what's happening there. Like, did they actually happen? Did they pass? Or are they there? Do they actually have the grants from the federal government? That's right. You know, are the rehabbers actually doing the work? Are there, like, you know, in certain bad neighborhoods, buildings that have been rehabbed and look fantastic? Yeah, one of the cities I'm looking at in my area, 
um, I saw that a whole block had been demolished. It was an old, old factory, and it had been demolished. That's a step in the direction. But then somebody told me, oh, by the way, in that old factory building over there, yonder, they're doing a lot of stuff inside that you don't see, but they're inside doing it. So I, I found out that they actually had started, which is good news. But right. you didn't see it that easily. Right. But it was going, so that's good. Right. Here's another thing that you could check. You could check, uh, just have a realtor um, pull sales for you in that area. Okay, we're gonna mm -hmm. t we're gonna talk about this uh, when we go through the phases. But another thing that you'll start noticing is is that the foreclosures are being sold more. There's mm -hmm. more foreclosures being bought. Right. Right. So you could start taking a look at, and the way you could do this, it's a very simple way to do this. Okay. Uh, what you could do is you could call a realtor, which they'll be glad to do because literally it takes like less than five minutes to do, and ask a realtor for the last, you know, like pick an area, like let's just say Meriden, Connecticut. Okay. I would call my realtor and say, hey, could you do me a favor? Could you uh, give me a list of all the sold properties? You want all because you don't want just resident. You want commercial and industry and all that. Can you give me a list of all the sold properties for the last 12 months? Mm. And they will give you an Excel spreadsheet. Right? Okay, what you yeah. do is you take that Excel spreadsheet and you upload it to a software. There's many of them, but like Google Maps. And you ask Google Maps to pin all of the addresses. So that means they put it on a map for you, like with the little pins, you can see where everything is. And you, when you do that, you will see clusters mm. of the sales, right? So if you're looking for uh, an emerging market, you can, uh, like even suppose, suppose, suppose uh, we were to go to Utah and we're looking for an emerging market in Utah and we don't live and we live in Connecticut. We can see where those clusters are, right? Now what we can do is we can start calling realtors in the area. We can call the economic development department. We could, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can call the police, police, and find out what's going on. We can start asking, hey, what about this area? You know, and you kind of like make this little area. What's going on over there? And you could find out because yeah. you were able to identify the sales. So you see something is starting to move. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now. Well, this is important. This is important because what people usually do is they come at the tail end when things have been screaming for a year or two. Go, oh, things are really hot there. We're going to talk and about start that. Start buying yep. stuff, right? Yeah, we're going to talk yeah. about that. That's a, those are different okay. phases, okay? So, okay. but for right now, if you have an area, I mean, you should do that anyways. You should, if you're a new investor and you're looking to find a farm market, that is one of the ways you should do it. You should call a realtor, get the last twelve months worth of sales. You know, if you're going to do houses, then just do residential. But I'm talking about emerging markets. You want industry. You want, you know, all kinds of things, right? Because yeah. let me ask you a question. Before Walmart builds a building, what do you think they do? Oh, well, they got to do uh, research to make sure there's enough customers that are going to come in. Mm -hmm. So they want to see what the area is like. So I don't know specifically what they would look for, but they're damn well not going to just pop a building someplace just willy-nilly. Did you know you can call Walmart and ask for that report and they'll give it to you? <laughs> I think I've heard that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that, right? How about Home Depot? That one I've kind of heard about. I think, did we know somebody who did that? Yeah. That was his job? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here's the thing is, is if you had these type of, uh, like suppose like you're, you're saying that in some emerging markets, like the market you're talking about and the city you're talking about, there's a specific company that's dumping billions of dollars into this area. Mm -hmm. right? So call them and ask them for their research. Yeah. And they'll share it. Because mm -hmm. you want to know why? Well, first of all, do you think they wouldn't share it because you think it's kind of like secret information? No, it's not a secret. It's happening. And if anything, they want people to be aware of it. Like if you, if, if you have a store want people to know you're there to sell stuff. So they want people to realize what's going on. I mean, the deal's sewn up. No one else is moving in on the territory. They got the, 
they got the deal, they got the land, they got the building, that's it. They're so going in. And they'll need some support around it. Right, exactly. So if you call and tell them you're an investor and you're looking to put some money in there and you wanted to uh, rebuild some of the housing, uh, the housing means people, like you said, people move in and people that are move in are going to go spend money in their stores. They want that. Well, they need places for their employees to live. That too. Employees is another one. Right? Or they want to have more selection of employees. Mm -hmm. Right? So these guys that do this kind of stuff are really clever about it. Yeah. You know, they get it. They, they, they're, not, they're not trying to hide. You know, they, they've already, like you said, they've already closed. They've already made their money. Now what they want to do is they want to support the store, which, uh, you know, <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, is the, the income is the oxygen of any business, right? Sure. So these, these companies want to have income, mm. okay? So does that make sense? So when we're looking for these places, that's what, those were some of the things that we would look for, all right? Yeah. All right, so uh, let's talk about the... Uh, the the breakthrough which by the way a lot of this information i was going to talk about at the end of the show but uh, a lot of this information you can find in a book that dave lindahl wrote which is uh called uh, i think it's real estate uh yeah, emerging markets for real estate yeah let me see emerging real estate markets is what it's called uh -huh. so what he talks about in this book is is that there's four types of markets I'm going to tell you what they are, and then we're going to go over each one, okay? Yeah. So the first one is buyer market phase one. Then there's buyer market phase two. Then there's seller market phase one, seller market phase two. So if you look at an area, you're going to want to plot it in one of these four categories. Mm -hmm. Right? And based on the research that we were just talking about, okay, it will help you figure that out. And I'm gonna give you some indicators to look for in each one of these markets so that you can sort it out, okay? So let's break it right. down. So we'll start with buyer market phase one, okay? This is where you find an oversupply of property and you may wonder how oversupply happens. Right. So, mm -hmm. what is oversupply? Well, there's too much. Okay. There's uh, there's more housing units, houses, apartments, con everything than there are people that want to be there. Right. So uh, vacancies are high. Right. So one of the reasons that this would happen is is that uh, a, a common thing is is you'll have uh, limits or 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 not limits more than like it on condos and apartments. Right. So what happens is, is pre 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 previous to these things being built, the uh, limits were loose and it allowed 5,000 people to live in a small piece of land. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. how many times have you seen that? You know, you got some farm, you know, and it's got, you know, five acres of land or 10 acres of land and they build 5,000 condos on it. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. that's one way that you could have overstock or too much inventory. Right. Right, because they overbuild, okay? Which is, uh, well, well they, they, I'm sorry, they didn't overbuild. That's number two, by the way. But w what happens is, is they, they, the restrictions in the city have to be changed, the zoning. Let me, oh, right. let me give you an example of this, okay? Uh, Meriden, Connecticut, in my career, did this, okay? What happened was they were struggling with tax money. Meriden has a lot of two, three, four-family houses. I mean, there's just blocks and blocks of two, three, four-family houses, okay? So yeah. let's think about this for a second. My taxes on my house in Wallingford, which is the city over, on a single family house is like, we'll say $4,500 a year. $4,300, sure. $4,500 a year. Mm -hmm. In Meriden, my three family house that I have, one of them, the taxes are like four grand a year. So that's four grand for like three families. And so that's okay because it doesn't make a difference 
except in that three family, how many kids are going to go to school? Same amount as three households or more. How about garbage pickup? More garbage. Right. So sure. you start going into these, you know, like all these these things that have to, the same amount of money has to pay for more. Right. So what Meriden did, because it was clever on their part, probably about 10 years ago, is they decided that the way they were going to fix their tax problem was, is they put enforcement in and char started changing their rules on renting. For example, in the beginning, I, I would look at a lot of two family houses that had a third floor that, some, that was illegal, but it was completely functional because somebody went up and put a kitchen in there and they were just renting it. Right, illegal, like it didn't have a, a second access or a exit, something like that? Some of them did. It just didn't have a permit. The city didn't know they were doing it. Got it. Right? Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. So the first thing they did is they put in, they put in some enforcement on that stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the other things they did is you actually have, a, you have to have a certificate of occupancy. So every two years, the city has to come out. You pay $25 per, per floor, and they have to inspect it. To make sure that it's up to compliance right and by doing all these little things what they did is they started restricting the amount of families that could live in these houses so what they were trying to do is that that two family was a three family they want to get it back down to a two family mm -hmm. the four family that was not supposed to be a four family and it was supposed to be a two family back down to a two family yeah. And over them over some time they were able to fix it because they were able to reduce the population per the tax disbursement. So the taxes wouldn't have been more but the expenses were less, that was the goal. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's just an idea, you know, one of the ways that, that it happens, okay? So that's reason number one. So the other reason that you have oversupply is because they overbuild. You know, uh, building became rampant to meet what was seemingly uh, a demand that was not really there. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there probably was, but things end eventually. <laughs> and I know, like, if you have a hot area, they're going to build, they're going to build, they're going to build. Well, how long does it take to build something? Get the permits, get the zoning, get the permission, get the contractors. It takes a year or two to build. Right. Things could cool down. Next thing you know, there's too much. So it might have been okay at one point. The time moves along, things change, and oops, we built too many. Okay, so let's talk about something else for a second, just based on what you just said. How could you mm -hmm. shortcut finding an emerging market? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've been trying to figure that out with you. What'd you come up with? So is it possible that you could just follow Amazon? You could follow Walmart, you could follow Home Depot, you can follow Walgreens, CVS, because I don't know about you, but I travel around, like I just drove from Connecticut to Florida and I was a bunch of cities. And it used mm -hmm. to be when you traveled, you know, 20 years ago, you would go from one location to another and there were different cultures. Now, when yeah, you go there. Isn't it disappointing now? Mm -hmm. Isn't it disappointing? You go someplace new, and it's Walmart, yeah. Rite Aid, CVS stuff. I mean, it's the same stuff. Why, why, all I get is palm trees if I go south now, mm -hmm. which is okay, but you know, you want to see different things just for the excitement of it. I just, I just saw on the news uh, the other day, which I don't watch much of these days, uh, Amazon released that they're hiring 75,000 people. Not surprising. Right? So yeah. where are those people going to work? Wherever the Amazon hubs are. So maybe they're building new ones? Yeah. You think that somebody in Amazon is in charge of that? Yes. Do you think that once Amazon's going to go there, that Wal Walmart's not going to go look? Hmm. And then Home Depot, and then Lowe's, CVS, Walgreens? Yeah. Pick them. McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, all the chains. Do you yeah. think that you can get on the phone for a morning or a day or two and start calling these people and somehow or another get in com conversation or communication with two or three of these guys and find out what they're looking at? What, what projects are they working on now? <clears throat> 
So let's say right now, you know, you find out three of them are looking in, uh, I don't know, uh, North Ke Carolina, Keokuk, or something Ke like that, right? <laughs> and, and, sure. and you and you go to that area and you talk to a realtor and say, can you give me the sales in the last 12 months, right? Pin, right, but pin they're it. Not, but they're not get, but they're not going to be so hot yet, are they? So you if it hasn't happened yet. Listen, to what I'm going to tell you. So you pin it, and then you put that in relationship to the business plan that Walmart had. Right. And you kind of start to connect the dots, literally. Hmm. Right. So if all the all the sales are over here and Walmart's over here, what's the path of progress? Yeah, that's the thing. That see that you're you're. Do that again. Put your hands up one more time. So, so the cluster is over here. Walmart's over here. Yeah. So, what's in so, between? Yeah, you look at the screen. That's a magnet on your left. Yeah. When you're looking at the screen, that's a magnet. Mm -hmm. So things are going to pull that way. So in between is a great area. Right. So Got you know. It. So if you're, if if the cluster's on the east side of town, and Walmart's building on the west side of town, then what's the drive route to get to Walmart? Because you, like you said, Walmart's a magnet. And if Walmart goes in there, right. Home Depot's going in there, and if Home Depot's going in there, Lowe's is going in there, and, and it starts. Mm. So what's the path of progress to that commerce? Right, because more, more buildings will go in there or shops will open up again where the barber is, the, the pizza, all, all the things that those people need to support them. Right. Between the house and between the job. How about hospitals? How about hospitals? Yeah. Yeah. Right. All that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's move on. So in this market, there's a time when more units come onto the market than there are people to buy them. Mm. This is this is buyer's market phase one. Okay. Yeah. Next thing you got to look at is job growth, right? There is uh, very little job growth in this section. Okay, it's still kind of stagnant because we're kind of really early now. Okay, yeah. so it's 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 buyer's market phase one. There's 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 stagnant job growth. Okay, and job losses are high, and causing people to still leave. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, now you have this inside intel, right? Because you know that Amazon's coming in or, but they haven't started yet. And the local investors or local people may not know this. Some might, but yeah. some may not. You would think people, know, but you know, there's a lot of amateurs. They just don't know. Right. I mean, think of your yep. town. How, how, how many times have you driven by and it's like, oh, I wonder what they're building there? Well, mm -hmm. that's probably two years into the pipeline. Sure. When you see it, but it's too late. it was undercover. Yeah. yeah. Right. It started to get too late. Yep. All right. So here, here, what you want to do. So now on each one of these, I want to talk about your investment strategy. Okay. Because that's what mm -hmm. we're about. So how do you invest in a buyer's market phase one? Okay, so yeah, here you buy for cash flow, right? Hey, Bill, I knew that one. Yeah, well, you've read the book yeah. too, so so you yeah, I don't remember everything though, but that's important mm -hmm. because you know from what you said, it's like, oh, geez, don't buy anything there. Right. Well, wait a minute. If you can buy, the price will adjust itself. Right. It, it can't be overpriced, and nobody will buy it. And if you can make cash flow, then you're okay. Right. So there's not much appreciation. Right. So money now and money monthly is your golden ticket in these markets. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at my seven strategies, which you can find at flippinghousesforrookies.com uh, forward slash free stuff. This is a great environment to do slot deals, the sandwich lease option transfers. It's a great market to do uh, lease options or rent to owns. You know, where you mm -hmm. rent to own from your seller and then sublease to your buyer with a 15% mm -hmm. equity spread and a 20 to 25% cash flow per month. Mm -hmm. It's also a good place to do subject to or getting the deed. Right. This is a great market for that. Well, what strikes me, correct me if I'm wrong, the prices will be fairly good because a buyer's market means it's favorable for the buyer. Right. That's the whole point. Right. 
But if you hang, if you're making cash flow, you're okay. And if you know that something is coming down the line a year or two down the road, well, everything's going to go up then. That's probably your point, right? Right. The rents are going to go up. It's going to appreciate. So no. you buy at one price and sell at another. You're 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 headed in the right direction. So uh, flipping houses for rookies this year. Uh, and I didn't even know I was doing this when I started because you can you can attest to this, okay? In December, I told you that I wanted to expand in 2020. Right. And what right. I wanted to do is I wanted to get out of my backyard. Well, look at the look at the screen, folks. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I wanted to start buying real estate in other cities. Right. But the crazy thing is, you didn't know how you're going to do it. But, but folks, it's this is how an entrepreneur works. This is how business people work. This is how successful people work. They don't follow. They just make up their mind. They want to do something. They don't have to know how it's going to happen. I decided six years ago I needed a new stream of income, a new job, something. I didn't know what it was going to be. And here a few years later, I'm doing this. I'm not this huge roaring billionaire, but I'm doing well. And this is way better than I was a few years ago with just constant opportunity right. that's unending. Right. even if I'm older. So that's how you do it. You make a decision. <clears throat> Go ahead, Bill, then tell, tell us what happened then, Bill. So now here it is uh, four months later, three and a half months later, and I have, in fact, I recorded a video yesterday and we're gonna have it come out. I have figured out how to buy, how to run a real estate business virtually, which means you buy and sell properties in areas that you don't live in opened up my my market to the whole country but bill you know anybody could say well with the coronavirus with all the virtual stuff you know you had to do it but you were doing this back before that happened. december looking for it all the coronavirus did for me was excel my activity yeah because as we talked about in a couple of podcasts ago as soon as i heard about the coronavirus i noticed it was a little bit of an emergency so i started to promote and honestly uh, i don't regret it but I'm working more now than I, I did six months ago. The amount of business I have is unbelievable. Yeah. Right? It's just, it's unbelievable. It's just, it, money is like not even like, yeah. But, you know, there's a lesson there. I talk to a lot of people I know. I'm a music teacher. I got students. I got neighbors. I got family. And uh, the last person I was texting to about this goes, well, you know, you got to wait it out. His wife lost a job. He's hardly working because he does restaurant work, um, equipment. He's hardly working. You got to wait it out. <clears throat> what do you mean wait it out? Wait? Wait? No. You mean find something to do. I don't care if you read a book. Just find 18 <clears throat> ways to make money on your own. Walk somebody's dog. I don't care what you do, but do something to do this business, some business. Find something to do. Don't sit there and wait. So I decided a couple days ago I wanted to buy an iPad because I wanted to make some videos and Emma said I needed to buy this. You know, I, I talked to her into buying it. She was like, you really don't need that, Dad. Well, that's what I want to do, right? So we're looking online and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like... No, she, she hasn't learned yet, has she? <laughs> yeah, she, <laughs> Sorry, she has, yeah, but... Just let her do, yeah. let them do it. <laughs> so I decide I'm not waiting online. I'm not doing all that. I'm getting in my damn car. It's the first time in the days I left the house. And I'm going to I'm going to Best Buy's. My sister's bitching at me because I'm living with her. My wife is bitching at me. You can't leave the house. Here's what happened. <clears throat> I just got done telling the story. I got in the car. I went over to Best Buy's. I drive in and the whole mall is closed. There's no, park, there's no cars in the parking lot. So I drive up to Best Buy, <clears throat> and I notice there's about six or eight cars parked on the curb, and there's a tent out front. I'm like, oh, I wonder what's going on here. I get out of my car, and there's nobody around me, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, nobody's going to... And I get about 10 feet away from the tent, and the girl says, can I help you? I said, yeah, I wanted to talk to somebody. I said, I wanted to see if I could buy an iPad. Some guy steps out from behind her, and he's about 10 feet away from me. Long story short... Here's what happened. I went back and got my car. I sat in my car on the curb. The guy stood eight feet away from me, talked to me, went back and forth in the store four or five times, getting my answers to my questions. What, no phone? No, just 10 <laughs> feet away from me. I'm sitting in the car. No, I mean, no, he's, no, he's going back and forth in the store. Can't he call them? <laughs> no, he, he works there. He's a Best Buy owner, uh, an employee. Goes inside, checks it on the computer, comes back out, gives me my answers. Twenty minutes later, I spent four hundred thirty bucks. 
on a store that pay for it. How'd you pay for it? Cash. Cash. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, what I was, actually, I I was used, expecting, actually I was expecting was, PayPal or something. No, right? I use I use my debit card. So actually, what happened was I asked them how much it was, and I went, and they had on you know one of the doors that slide open, the door was open, and he had a register right there. He was about four or five feet away from me on the other side of the register. I stuck my card in there, pushed the numbers, he gave me a receipt, I left. But he told me I didn't have to do that. He said he would take my card. I didn't have to get out of the car if I didn't want. In the interim, while I'm, while I'm waiting for him to do these questions, I'm looking in my rearview mirror because all the cars are behind me, and there's guys, employees, rolling out carts, carts with boxes of yeah. stuff, televisions, and yeah. on a store that's closed. Yeah. So it's is the glass half full or half empty? Well, some people see half empty, some people half right. full. Obviously, some businesses are having trouble, and some are just screaming. Right. Uh, and the way we do in the business is much different. So definitely deliveries are going to be more. I mean, people are ordering food from Stop and Shop in, in stores, you know, yep. being delivered. You know, so will we have more warehouse supermarkets where you don't go? You just order food and they just drop it off? My sister. And they have less aisles. and you know. My sister, uh, I'm not trying to knock her, but she, she doesn't do as well as I do, obviously. And so, you know, they work hard. They both work. He works. She works. And, you know, they kind of struggle along. While I've been here. Every day we order something from the grocery store. I've completely stocked all her shelves. I, I'm ashamed to even tell you how much money I spent. And it's, and, it's, and it's got the numbers four digits. I've stocked all her shelves, all her cabinets. There's all kinds of supplies here, right? Because, and, and she bitches at me because she's like, I'm like, let's order lunch. Let's order, order what restaurant you want to go to. She's like, we got all this food. Why don't we just eat our food? I said, because I want to support the local businesses. And we'll order thirty dollars worth of food for everybody in the house, and they yeah. deliver it. They leave it on the front steps. We go out, we pick it up, and then we leave. Yeah, I did that the other day, and the the, the doorbell rings, and you go to the door. Guys in the car waiting for you to get it, and he leaves when you pick it up. No contact. Pay by phone. Okay, so let's get and, back. Uh, let's get back to the podcast because we're way off time here. So, so in this market, the jobs are shrinking. Everything's shrinking. Okay, and. Uh, you're looking for, uh, here the market starts to absorb, uh, I'm sorry, the only time you want to invest, which we talked about in phase one, is when it's, you know, usually what happens is it's your backyard. That's why you're investing in this market. It's usually your backyard. Yeah, well, it's easier to know what's going on and to manage it and uh, take care of it, basically. Right. So what I'm telling you is, is the way the world is and the virtualness of it is, is that you could you could find these markets and invest in them with slot deals, rent to own deals, and subject to deals, and never leave your desk. Yeah. Right? Now let's go into buyer's market phase two. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here, the market starts to absorb the oversupply of the property. Right? Rental space starts to fill up. Time on the market starts to decline, mm -hmm. right? As more jobs, uh, as more jobs come into the area, appreciation starts to quicken, right? This is an exciting time. During this time, uh, bank foreclosures will start to rise. That's a real good indicator, right? And and you'll know this because you'll start seeing foreclosure wars, bank foreclosure wars. You put an offer in on a house, three months ago, your offer would have been okay, you might have done the haggle, two, three thousand, and that's it. Now it's so, three or four months later, and you're like, what do you mean I put a bid in for 65,000 and somebody paid 85,000? What are you talking about? Right, right. So these are foreclosures that are left over from like buyers one that are still there but they're selling more because things are picking up. So the sales are picking up. There's not more foreclosures. Well, like I said, the, more sales. the appreciation starts to quicken. Yeah. Right? So that means yeah. that the appreciation is faster. Where before it might have taken two years to appreciate or five years, now it's yeah. like you buy something on Friday and it appreciates by Monday. It starts to go like that. Because mm -hmm. right? I've been in that market, right? Yeah. 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 Rents start to increase. That's another good indicator. 
Mm -hmm. Right? This is by far the most profitable phase to invest in. Okay? But it won't be emotionally easy. This is the most profitable phase to be in, but emotionally it will kick your ass. Why is that? Uh, because you put an offer in on a house that you paid the two weeks ago or a month ago, you bought a house for sixty-five thousand, and this week you got to pay seventy-five thousand for the same house. Yeah, that's emotionally like, what am I doing wrong? What am I missing? What's happening? You start to introspect. You yeah. start questioning yourself. You start thinking, what's going on? Unless you have this data that we're talking about, you won't know what's going on. You think it's you. You think you're doing something wrong. You're not outside of your box. You're not. You, this is your backyard now, right? Mm -hmm. This is when it happens in your backyard, okay? Unless you know this data, then you can do it somewhere else, right? Uh, if you can get in early enough, right, most investors won't catch on for probably six months or a year down the road, right? Mm. Uh, so it's better to catch what's happening while times are still hard. So it's like the end of phase one, the beginning of phase two is like the perfect time to make millions of dollars oh yeah absolutely that's like the sweet spot mm -hmm. right but you got to do your homework well this is the crystal ball moment this is the crystal ball moment that everybody talks about that they don't think is there but it's as obvious as obvious could be if you go look for the right data Right, and this is before everything hits the newspaper and how great it is in this area and how people are buying so much and it's so hot here. Oh, look, honey, look how good it is there. Right. Eh -eh. right. Eh -eh. So how do you invest, uh, you know, what kind of investing do you do in a buyer's market phase two? Okay, so as I said earlier, this is uh, uh, the start of an emerging market. This mm -hmm. is the beginning. So when you find... Uh, Anything that makes sense, or actually you'll start to find things make sense, right? Mm -hmm. You'll start to notice that it's, uh, you, when you understand what we're teaching you here and you understand what's going on, it'll start to make sense. Oh, I better do something, okay? So, yeah. um, I was just thinking that this virus came along and America seems to think that the whole United States went into a buyer market phase one. They think that people don't have jobs and that mm -hmm. they're not gonna be able to pay their mortgage and it's all gonna collapse. Well, whether that's true or not, they're just worried, huh? Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me choke on my cigar. Let me ask you a question. This is kind of like when I have a subject to person that is worried about if I take over their loan, they can't get another loan. And that's because all they're, right. all they're thinking about is when they give the bank their financials, they're just going to say, oh, well, the bank's not going to give them money because they have this $1,500 a month mortgage and their income doesn't overcome paying this $1,500 a month mortgage and a new mortgage. Right, because this person's got rid of their house, they want another one, so they need a second mortgage, and the finances look off now. Right. But what they don't take into account is, is that if I'm paying the mortgage and I give them a document saying I'm paying the mortgage, I'm going to pay $1,500 a month, they could take that $1,500 a month and put it in their profit and loss statement and show the income as well as the outgo. Sure. Right? So That's the whole, that's the whole story. Right. So... Why, the reason why I'm saying that is, is if you think about the country, the country's been three or four years in a massive incline. Right. People have saved money. They mm -hmm. have the money. So when I hear on the news that it's going to crash and foreclosures are going to go down, yeah, that might be for the D tenants, you know, A, B, C, D tenants. Uh -huh. But what about guys like you and I that have been making money and salted some away? We could survive mm -hmm. a month or two. There's a lot of Americans like that. Do they want to? No. But, you know, we have credit cards. We have credit lines. We have all these things that we can do to help us get through. And uh, we're, we're made to believe the foreclosures are going to go up, but we forget to talk about what about the three or four years worth of good economy and all that money. Where did it go? They think everybody sure, spent it? Yeah, it's a few months compared to, like, 40 months. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, if we go much longer than May of 2020... You know, we go more than a couple months and start going to the three months. I agree with you, then we might have a problem. 
but most people yeah. I think could swing a month or two on an average. Right? Yeah. Most, not everybody, most. No, when you say that, I'm sorry, I get disturbed because the thing you said about the banks, giving people three months to, to pay, and then expecting it all on the fourth month. Right. That's like, uh, you know. So yeah, that doesn't matter. The, the strategy in a, in a buyer's market phase two is, as I said earlier, this is, a, 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 is the very start of the emerging market. And when you find this market, everything makes sense. Mm -hmm. I suggest you uh, still buy and hold. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't sell quickly. If you do, you'll be giving up huge profits. So the cash flow might not be as good now if rents are going up, but the the uh, allure of the appreciation down the road uh, outweighs that. Is that right? Why wouldn't the rents be going up? No, the rents are going up in, in buyers too. Right, right, buyers too. So the rents are going to start going up. So the cash flow isn't as good because. Uh, well, if the rents. Well, the prices are. So if, is the cash flow about the same? If the rents are going up, what's that going to do for cash flow? Well, the rent, yeah, the, it'll give you the cash flow. But the prices are going up too, so it, it may even out a little bit. But the cash flow is still okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the real incentive is that as long as the cash flow is reasonable. And now, this is property by property too. Yeah. It's not, you know, generally it can be, but you have to analyze each property. As long as there's reasonable cash flow, you got a good uh, prediction for the uh, appreciation. So concept. like with me right now, and I did this uh, instinctively because of the market, because of this data, I told you in December of 2019, I wanted to increase my business. And how was I going to do that? I was going to mm -hmm. concentrate hard on slot deals, lease option deals, and subject to. I would buy the others, but I wasn't interested in going to look for properties that had deeds in my name. Right. Because rent to owns and slot deals, I could make money by controlling the paperwork and not owning the property. Like Nelson Rockefeller said in the early 1900s, don't own anything, but control everything. Mm-hmm. Right. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to be a, I wanted, I wanted rents and I wanted the money, but I didn't want to be a landlord. Yeah. And this is how we, this is my business plan for this year right now. So basically all I did is I picked the strategies of my seven strategies, which is why I have seven strategies that work best in my economic environment. And I switched them because we were for the last few years doing buy, buy and flips, right? We were doing rehabs sure, and flips. They, yeah, yeah. Well, they, good opportunities came up, so we weren't going to pass them by. But I'm glad we sold our last one in uh, February. Right. Yeah. Did you notice that we that we, you know, and this was a little bit a little bit of luck, but more more my strategy and talking to you yeah. about it. We we yeah. when the virus hit, uh, we were prepared because I kept telling you for a year the market's going to change. The market's going to change in de December of 2000. 19, I started like really pushing the lease options, the slot deals and the subject twos, and that's what I've been buying. And we managed to get rid of all of our heavy weight, clean out the inventory. And now I have my rents coming in, all my rents are paid, right? And everything's fine. Cause yeah. we, we, yeah. I saw the telltales coming the end of last year and we made, we made adjustments because of this information. Mm -hmm. I saw it coming. And it's just, it's safer. You know, people worry about real estate because it's a big expense and you could lose a lot, but this is safe real estate. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's no risk because the most we put into a deal nowadays is $100. Yeah. So how, how, do, you, how do you not risk money in real estate? Yeah, don't put any in. But boom. boom. Mm -hmm. So I'm telling you to buy and hold, right? Yep. So the reason why I'm telling you to buy and hold is because the market's going to appreciate. So yep. why would you want to sell right now and make 10 grand when you could wait six months or a year and make a hundred grand? That's right. Why would you want to do that? Right? You wouldn't. Nope. So let's move on to seller market phase one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So seller market phase one, this is the latter half of the emerging market. Right like the second half or the later half, okay? Mm -hmm. And a market trans, uh, transitions into this phase 
when it makes economic sense to start building again. Now you know this right. because you you spotted a couple cycles that I didn't spot last year because it was like building was up. So when the building goes up, mm. you know, the building new buildings goes up, then you know you're probably in a seller market phase one or two. Right. People have caught on. They know that uh, there's people that want to live there, probably because there's jobs, because you can't live without jobs. And they realize there might not be enough homes and apartments for these people and condos, so they build some more. Right near me, I was shocked. I went by the town next to me that is not doing so hot for years, and it's like, ooh, don't go there. And then there's a brand new apartment building. Like, what the hell? And there's more being planned, because I talked to the folks, like, seriously? So it's already kind of, I mean, it, this thing hasn't even started this big job thing, right? Right, right. But you see, they're actually thinking ahead to like, well, let's build some. Right. So you can see things are actually happening. So this is a phase where local investors are now convinced the good times are here to stay. Mm-hmm. Right? So they start investing again. Outside investors are jumping in and the market starts to build. Mm-hmm. This Looks phase really is good. Looks good. Right. Nice and hot. Hey, yeah. honey, things are hot over there. <laughs> yeah. The fish are jumping. That's right. This phase is when it is uh, competitive for buyers of property and it creates price wars. Yep. Prices are higher than they should be. It's hard to buy stuff. So it's good for the sellers now, not for the yep. buyers. Yeah. So how do you invest in a seller's market phase one? In this market, you should uh, do both flip properties for big profits and hold properties for cash flow and appreciation. Mm -hmm. Which if you think about it, Peter, this is exactly where we've been with our business, th most the end of 2018 and a lot of 2019. Mm -hmm. We, I was buying apartment buildings and holding them and I was also buying uh, flips. Right. 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 I mean, not to brag, but our last flip, the one you were talking about, we closed in February, made a gross profit of 90 something thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you do that? No, as right? long as uh, I mean, I'm glad, you know, you know, there's a house I've been looking at that's been abandoned locally. And I've been trying to buy it. But right now, I'm not sure I want to buy it. Yeah. Not right now. Yeah, We should talk about that later because I'm curious about that. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to talk about stuff when uh, people aren't, aren't working at the tax office. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, I keep okay, driving by it and there it is. Somebody, somebody's got to help that poor thing one day. But what you're talking about is much safer and much more intelligent. Right. So if you bought a property in a buyer's market, phase one and phase two, right, you probably have built a lot of equity and now is the perfect time to sell. Yeah, you're going to you're going to do that in seller market phase one. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you a reason why not phase two in a couple minutes. Mm. OK, yeah, take those take those profits and buy bigger and more equity properties. But so where? That, yeah. And, and 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 there you go. So you're going to go to another emerging market and invest there and a buyer market phase one or phase two and mm -hmm. do it again. Mm -hmm. Someplace else. Right. And when you read Dave Lindahl's book, he's got some great stories of how he did this in Boston. Really? And it was almost, I, I mean, really, it was pretty much just an accident because uh, he didn't know what this was going in. He learned as he went, but right. it's, uh, it's some great stories there. Yeah. Okay, so now we're in seller market phase two. Okay. Okay. This is the riskiest market. This is the one that mm. everybody worries about, okay? Which I want to I divert again. I know that we're, we're really way into the podcast here, but I want to divert again, okay? Yeah. One of the things that I learned in the car business, because I used to buy 75, 100 cars a month, you know, and I would go along and I would buy a certain model of a car, we'll say, I don't know, a Ford Explorer, and I'd be buying that certain year for, we'll say, $8,000, yeah. All of a sudden, this week at the auction, it was 8500 83, 8500 Hmm. Right? And I would think, hmm, 
And, I, and if I wish I knew this information, because I would have made a lot more money in the car business, right? Yeah. Then next week, I got to pay 86 or 8700 By the time I get to the third week, I got to pay nine, ten grand for this car. What's going on? Okay. So it's like the market was emerging. Okay, so now I'm going along and I'm buying these things for ten grand, ten grand, and I'm selling them. Then all of a sudden the market drops, mm. and they go back to seven grand. <laughs> Ouch! Right. The lesson that I learned was this: is you always buy and sell whatever it is you're buying, and selling within the same market. Mm. If you switch markets, is when you lose money. That's what's happening with real estate. We bought a property in a buyer's. Uh, buyer's market phase one and we're now in a buyer and a seller market phase two mm. we did good but if it goes the other way and we buy in a buy in a seller market phase two mm. because this is cyclical because what what which one comes after this one peter well it goes back it, it crashes back to buyers one right you know, it's like it's a wave it goes up it goes down things go too far one direction and it kind of implodes. And how many how many jobs can you put in an area? How many businesses right. can get in there? It eventually, you know, kind of peaks out. Yay, we did our thing. Yay, party's over. Oops. And what happens to a lot of people when they start making money? They get cocky, right? Well, they do. The, you know, was the week before last we did about, or was it last week you talked about emergency and affluence? Yep. Like when you have a lot of money, you think, oh, look at me, like some rock star, you know? It's Some never going to stop. Rock star with money coming out of his pocket buys five mansions, twelve Cadillacs, and gives them to all his employees. So the next never record doesn't stop. sell. Boom! Now he's a minister. Right. Sorry. <laughs> and he went from having a fifteen hundred dollar, a fifteen hundred square foot house, to a with a with a twelve hundred dollar month mortgage, to a ten thousand square foot house with a seven thousand dollar month mortgage. Uh huh. And he starts losing money now, and what do you think happens? Yeah. Boom. Right? Not good. So that's this market right here. So this is the riskiest market. Here, buyers start to slow down. Days on the market increase. And gone are the bidding wars. Yeah. And this but, is just, this is after when everybody says, when everybody says, go there, don't go there. And that's what I spot in some places. But everybody says it's good. That means it's right. too late. If everybody knows, it's too late. So you want to know what I think is amazing, Peter? This that, is like amazing. That I'm a man ahead of my time, Bill? Yeah, oh boy. We're going to start with that again. No, but this you are now. I, you are. You are. You're the man ahead of your time now. Thank you. So so here's what I think is amazing. And, and this is, I got to just take a personal moment here, okay? Because I noticed this years, decades ago, mm. okay? Mm. If you did what we're talking about right now in the stock market, you go to jail for inside trading. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in real estate, it's the opposite. You're a savvy investor if you know this. Yeah. Like, well, which is, which is the reason why I invest in the stock market. I mean, because I could take $5,000, put it in the stock market, and as long as the $5,000 stays there, I keep getting my yield, right? Yeah, maybe. That's good. Okay, let's say I'm a smart investor and I get my yield. Yeah. Suppose I take that same $5,000 and I, and I put it in real estate. The first thing that happens is, is my $5,000 turns into a $100,000 asset. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that happens. Mm -hmm. Second thing that happens is it gives me my return, right, which is controllable. Yep. Third thing that happens is if I get in trouble and I want to take that five thousand out, I could refinance it, get my five thousand out, and still keep my income. Can't yeah. do any of that with the stock market. No, there's way better leveraging with real estate. Yeah. Period. Period. A okay. hundred dollar deposit for an option. Period. Right. So, in the beginning stage of this phase, prices are still inflating but they are taking longer to sell, mm -hmm. right? More days on the market. It's too much did we, or, did we or did we not experience this last this past year? Oh, hell yeah. I've been making right? calls to buy certain properties and it was just too hot. Yeah. It was just too much. Almost, or, almost everywhere. Or the properties everywhere. that we were buying and rehabbing where they would sell in a week or two, they were taking two months. When we just sold, it took what two and a half months to sell it. We did good um, with it, 
but we put it on the market. It was a couple months before we got a deal. It wasn't two weeks like it was the year before. Mm -hmm. Right? It was longer days in the market. Now, mm -hmm. we ended up doing it because we did a good rehab and all that stuff, but it was longer days in the market. That's always been my indicator. Yes. Yeah. Is when that happens, I didn't, you know, now that I know this, it's a lot easier, but prior to knowing this data, that was always my indicator. It's like, ah, uh -uh, I don't want to get stuck with another one. I think I'm going to wait and see what happens. Right. Okay. Right. So investors start to realize the market is changing and they put, and they put more properties on the market. Everybody's trying to dump. Mm-hmm. Right, which is what I was talking about earlier. You know, the uh, the the person that's not an investor but owns property, right now, with the virus, hears on TV that it's going to be a bunch of foreclosures and stuff like that, and they're thinking, oh my God, the market's going to crash. If they were like on the fence with like I should sell, they're just dumping property. I'm telling you, I got coaching clients that haven't done deals and have been having trouble making deals or making deals right now. People are just saying yes. Right now is the best damn time to be in real estate ever. Ever. In yeah. my 16 plus years, I've never had an, a market like this. I am so excited about the future. It's like unbelievable. I don't want to do anything else but just this. I'm having trouble teaching real estate right now because it's taking away from my investment skills because there is so much money to be made right now. It's unbelievable. Yeah. What's really strange about this is most economic problems are actually real economic problems. Right. Real estate, tech bubbles, th these are things that are big economic problems that crash. We have an illness that will go away. Right. You know, they, oh, it's not going to go away for a year or two. Baloney. Baloney. Right. Doesn't work that way. So this is a short term, but people are going to worry. So we have a short span in a sense, and it's gonna, it has to uptick. It forced me to take my real estate business virtual, which was the best thing that ever happened to me because now it's accepted by others. Yeah. And just like we were talking about you with your guitar business, it forced you to go to virtual. And if you want to expand that business, now is the time to do it because it's, it's easier to do now. It forced me to do things I didn't even know was possible. Mm. Well, necessity, mama of invention. Yeah. So in this phase, we're almost done. We're going to end off here pretty soon. In this phase, this is where the average layman person says we're in the bubble. Yeah, and we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So this starts to fuel a downward trend because people are putting their houses on the market because they're trying to cash out, right? Smart investors have started to pull out long ago, mm. right? Job growth has become stagnant. Population growth has started to decline. Fewer people are there which means there's less demand for properties. Overbuilding leads to oversupply. Mm -hmm. Sellers lower prices so they can pay off loans. They lower rents to get tenants. The foreclosures start to rise. Apartment buildings start having higher vacancy factors, right? And issues with, uh, uh, and here's another good indicator is, is uh, rent, you know, the big apartment buildings start, start offering incentives. Yeah. A you know, sign on, sign on bonuses. Yeah. Or free month or, you know, we'll give you this if you sign on, if you, if you sign up now, you start seeing that, you know, you're in a seller's market phase two. Yeah. Right. So here's a good indicator. This is a Dave Lindahl thing. This is not me. This is Dave. I don't want to take credit for this. He mm -hmm. says that if you monitor the building permits always, mm -hmm. which I want to start doing, mon we don't do this, but I want to monitor the building permits for the number of, of permits pulled is a good gauge, mm -hmm. right? It will give you a clear sight of where supply will be in the next year or two. Right. It's a great statement. So thank you, Dave Lindahl, for that. Yeah. Okay. How to invest in the seller's market phase two. I'm going to end off with that. Okay. So in the beginning of this stage, uh, you want to sell and move on to another merging market. Right. Right. Towards the end of the stage, there are huge bargains, but it takes courage to do it. So this will be at the very, very end, just before it becomes buyer one again. It'll, it'll hit bottom and wind up buyer's market. So you and I right now are in a seller's market phase two in Connecticut. Hmm. 
right? And I'm buying. How am I buying? I'm buying as if I'm going into a buyer's market. I'm yeah, a buyer's market phase one. Mm -hmm. What am I looking to do? I'm looking to get cash flow. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, right. And the only way to be free of risk in any of this is to make sure that you have plenty of equity. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, up to 50%. So have plenty of equity. Because if the market's slowing down, you can get away with that. Because if people are selling for what they owe for, equity's easy to get. Oh. Because it'll yeah. come back. They'll give you more equity in the house It's because they're a little more, they're more worried. They went off the loan. Yeah. Now that they went from, and this is, this is where I talk about, you know, uh, the difference between sellers. There's only two differences between sellers. There's two kinds of sellers, right? Yeah. There's one one seller that is is of the impression or has the idea that this this asset, this is an asset. Oh right, right. He's glad right? he and has it. It'll make him money. Right. It, honey, we got one. Yeah. And Kiyosaki says assets make money. Liabilities cost money. Right. He's taking a lot of shit for that, but that's the best ex explanation of accounting I ever heard in my life. Yeah. So people that have properties that have like this savings account, and they have this profit, or as we call it in a real estate equity, and they're, and they're trying to go to the savings account and they're trying to get their equity because they want their cash. Yep. That's one way. That's what most realtors deal with. That's what a realtor deals with mostly is the people that are looking to get their assets mm -hmm. cashed in. Okay. Right. Except when a market does what we're talking about now, the realtor can't perform. Mm. Right? So it then puts them into the second type of an owner that I'm talking about, which is a person that has a problem and sees the property as a liability. Right? Yeah. It's like, I just, want, I just want to get off the loan. I don't want the problem anymore. I don't care about making money. Mm. He's more, I just about, wanna, he's more worried about losing money right. than making money. He'd so rather become, wind up even or walk away than lose right. instead of maybe winning and maybe not winning. So it becomes liability management at that point. Right. Right. Loss mitigation. Yeah. There you go. Here's right. Word. So it's like they're just like trying to mitigate their losses. Mm -hmm. Find those sellers and you start doing creative real estate. So in our market this is what's happening right now is we're in a in a in a seller's phase two we're we're starting to decline right we had you know in wallingford i had bristol myers move out we had you know a couple big companies move out of the city oh. all the indicators are there job losses up right all the indicators are there so what am i going to buy i'm going to buy lease options mm. I'm going to buy cash flow, mm -hmm. and I'm going to squat in a year or two when it turns around and appreciation comes back. What am I going to have? I'm going to be in a buyer's market phase two, mm -hmm. or seller market phase one, and I sell. Right. Because I'm going to be able to, as the months go on now, I'm going to be able to start paying what people owe because they want relief. Mm -hmm. So. When the market's good and the realtor is kind of a hot shot and can go get the money and take the asset and give it to the seller, they're cocky. But when the realtor is in this market and it starts to decline and they can't get the money or the people can't get approved, right? So what do you think is going to happen in four months from now when people are trying to buy real estate and they show, go show their bank statements and they don't have income for three months or two months because it is virus? They What's going to happen? Well, see, they, if the person can't get a mortgage... Isn't that a perfect person for rent to own? Yeah, there you go. Because shortly, his bank statement will look good again within six months to a year. It'll look fine again. Right. So what? What? what why? That's the reason why we're doing what we're doing is is because if we're going to be in this market, we're going to pay attention to cash flow. Mm. Right. So you got to be patient. Now's the time to be patient because in Connecticut or in my market, I'm not saying this is everywhere in the country, but you could take a look at what we just explained. And in my market, we're in a seller phase two. So I just yeah. switch my strategy, which, which, which foot do I go first on making offers? 
which is where we came up with the three offers we make right now because we're making offers without even looking at houses now. Mm -hmm. We're doing a slot deal, we're doing a rent to own, and we're doing a cash deal. Cash deals are 50 cents on a dollar. Mm -hmm. And I'm not getting resistance from my sellers because they're starting to realize the market's starting to drop. Yeah. Where six months ago they were like, what are you nuts? I would never do that. You know how many coaching clients? I will, I will go on a limb here and then we'll end off. I will go on a limb here and say, I'll bet you 25 to 30% of my coaching clients right now are in deals that they proposed three or four months ago and they were told they were nuts and now they're back and saying, is it still possible? Nice. 25 to 30%. Nice. Because, because we went into a seller's market phase two. We were in phase one, now we're in phase two. And the coronavirus just excelled that. Mm. Where normally that wouldn't happen until the end of the year, beginning of next year. Mm -hmm. Now it's here because of the job loss. Yeah. Because that's one of the indicators is job loss. You know, and as sad as that is, because uh, this isn't good. If you don't know anybody that's been ill, it's not good. I have a family member. They're okay now, but it's not good. But we're not, we're not sitting here like, ha ha, we can take advantage of this. There are people right. that have a problem with a house that they can't get rid of, and they're right. worried. This will help them. Right. And I don't think you should take advantage of those people either. You should help them no. and do the right thing. Yeah, yeah so the prices will be fair enough. It's not like screwing them. But if we don't do that, the realtor can't help them. Who's going to? So I just want right. to make that clear because all the books I read on real estate, all the best guys always talk about don't be a jerk. Yeah. You know, be decent about it because it will help somebody and someone else trying to buy who can't buy, it will help them, and you get paid for helping people. Exactly. Okay. So basically, there's a line in the dirt, right? And sellers went from the left side of the line that says, I'm going to make money on this real estate, to, oh, shit, how am I going to get rid of this? Yeah. And how much is it going to cost me to the other side of the line? Mm. And that is happening right now, which is why I say the most amount of money is made in chaos because that line's been drawn nationally. Mm. And, and we're not, we don't need a bunch of loans. We don't need to go get, you know, like all these REITs, you know, real estate investment trusts and all these uh, Wall Street guys. They're going to start backing off. They're well, going to the stop buying. Are, interest rates are already crashing. Right. And they're, gonna, they're not going to want to buy these properties because they're starting to depreciate. You know, I've told you this how many times? How many investors think that they're smart investors and savvy investors in an up economy? Yeah. Any and luck, it's not hey, them. Any lucky bastard. Right. Now what's going to happen is, is we're going to filter out all those guys and we're going to start, the, the real guys are going to stay now. Right. Well, the guys, that could, when the guys are, that could... Go ahead. The guys that are the guys that could make money without real estate—I mean, make, uh, buy real estate without money right now—are going to survive and do well. Yeah. The guys that are using money are going to go by the wayside, and the money's going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah. So, before we end off here, I want to say one more time, thank you, Dave Lindahl. He wrote this book in 2008, which is called *Emerging Real Estate Markets*. Now, I didn't get all my data there, but for sure it was concise and it was easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So you should uh, go buy his book and you should read it. He is a phenomenal guy. He's an apartment guy from Massachusetts. He, he owns over 8,000 apartments and teaches it. Uh, you and I have gotten help from him. Uh, he, if you want to do apartments, he's the guy. Go, go get in his program. It's very reasonable. There's a lot of smart people there. They've got things figured out. They have formulas. Dave Lindahl, he's been around for 20 years. He's been around as long as Ron LeGrand. He's a Ron LeGrand student. Mm. Uh, just go, if you're looking for that, go talk to Dave, go talk to his crew. They're family run and they are phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal people. Um, so if you're looking to go learn how to do apartment buildings and that kind of stuff, he has got it figured out and he's got some amazing training. So just just go check him out, or just go get his book. And he's got other books too. If you type in Dave Lindahl, 
Uh, which, by the way, his, uh, can I spell his name here? I don't, I can't spell his name here. I think I've got L-I-N-D-H-A, uh, D-A-H-L. Yeah. That's Do close enough. If that isn't it, you'll find it. I think that's it. Say it again. L-I-N. L-I-N-D-A-H-L. Right. Swedish? Yeah, probably. Uh, but just go to Amazon. He's got several books. His his millionaire, you're, you're reading that now, right? His millionaire, uh, real estate millionaire book is yep. phenomenal. He actually, yeah. he actually, for real, no hype, actually writes the checklist on how to buy apartment buildings in that book. Mm-hmm. And you read it the first time and said it was good, and then you're reading it again, and you're like, oh, my God. After we've been through all the training and spent all these yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars, you're like, oh, my God. The, that book had well, everything in it. The Emerging Market book gave the idea of where to look and, and why and how. This book, the millionaire one, uh, is more, more details on how to buy each property and the process. And it's like right. a course, you know? It's bizarre. We've taken courses. I like this because it's like a course in a book. Right. Very concise. I mean, really not concise, deep. You know, it's good. Yeah, he's a got a details. lot of details. He does not skip. He does not hype it. He does not, you know, he, he's not trying to sell you anything in the book. He's just being him. And he started with single family homes, two and three unit apartments, and then big, big ones. So you can use the data for single families or two, three families, six, whatever you want to do. So it, it right. applies. Yeah. So if you want to do that, then go there because he's got some phenomenal stuff. Okay, and he's definitely uh, Mm -hmm. influenced this podcast. Uh, I read the book. I mean, we've had our own experiences that we've added to it, but I'm not. I don't don't want to plagiarize his stuff or anything like that. I want people to know that he's a fantastic guy. Go get his Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right, Pete. I think we're done. We went uh, a little bit over today, uh, again, but uh, yet again, I think we had another podcast. If anybody out there is listening. Uh, and it has questions, go to FlippingHousesForRookies.com. Top right-hand side of the page is a support ticket. You can send me uh, questions, and I will gladly answer your questions. Um, if you're listening to us on a podcast, uh, please go subscribe to the podcast so you can see us uh, pop up every week when we uh, upload our podcast. And, of course, uh, please go give us reviews. If you go to FlippingHousesForRookies.com, just scroll down the page about halfway. You can see that all the podcasts are there. They're in a little square. And right below that, there's a button that you can give us reviews. And uh, you can uh, help us out and tell us what you think. Okay? All right, Pete. I'm going to uh, go have my uh, breakfast, which is really my lunch. And then uh, I actually have a couple deals I'm going to try to make this afternoon. So I have a piece of property in Middletown i got to lead on that. The guy's in the military and got transferred, and he wants off his property in the next two weeks. So okay. uh, let's see if I can make a deal this afternoon. All right. All right? Okay. So uh, thanks for being with me. Thanks for being with us, Pete and I. Uh, next week, we got. I think what I'm going to try to do next week is I have a couple coaching clients that are from Texas wholesaling four or five properties a month, and I think we're going to have them on as a guest speaker and find out what they're doing. Oh, that'll be fun. So it'll be fun. So i got to arrange it with them. It might be the week after, but it's coming. We've been to Texas. Let's talk some more Texas people. Exactly. Let's get our boots and our cowboy hats on. They smoke cigars. Maybe we'll do it all at the same time. (laughs) All right, guys, over and out. Have a good day. Thank you for being here. Thanks for tuning in to the hottest real estate topics on the planet with Bill and Pete. If you want to continue learning how to buy and sell real estate without money or credit, head over to FlippingHouses.club for some cutting-edge real estate wealth tools. Or contact us at info at FlippingHouses.club.